Hi, everybody. It's Mike. You're about to hear part one of a two-part interview that I did with Jack Ward on Pussy Willows and Cattails. The first part of the interview will be coming out a day or two before the Christmas holiday of 2023. The second part will be coming out right after the new year. The first Hope you enjoy. Is truly a poet. He's an artist. He is a friend and an inspiration to anyone who I think who has ever played the guitar uh, or tried to write poetry. Would you please welcome Gordon Lightfoot? Pussy willows, cattails, soft winds and roses, rainbows in the woodland, water to my knees, shivering, quivering the warm breath of spring. Pussy Willows, Cattails, Soft Winds and Roses. This is Carefree Highway Revisited, the show that celebrates the work of Gordon Lightfoot song by song, a proud member of the That's Not Canon podcast network. I'm your host, Mike Messner, and along with me today is a fellow Lightfoot fan from Nova Scotia, Jack Ward. Jack, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Mike. What a great joy, especially at this point in my life, to revisit Gordon Lightfoot's music. It really is. And I think the fact that we're talking about it, and particularly songs like this, which are from his early period, we're still talking about them this many years later, I think speaks volumes to the man's talent. How did you first get into Lightfoot's music? Now, you being a native Canadian, I would imagine you had some exposure to it, but what was the specific experience? Sure. So he had a huge connection, obviously, to California for a while, but for Canadians, there are probably two Canadians, maybe three, that sort of typify that kind of singer-songwriter of that time that speak to the voice of Canada. And there's Stan Rogers, there's probably Valdi, and Stan's brother as well. But definitively, I think the, the granddaddy of them all is Gordon Lightfoot. And so... So many people were inspired by him. So many people, his music was constantly, like his hits, I should say, were constantly being played in Canadian radio stations. But for me, I think that my whole life changed when I worked at a camp for the mentally handicapped. It was called Camp Bellwood. And it was about four or five kilometers from my house. And there, my whole life as a guitar player and singer-songwriter myself began because there was a flag lord and I said who's that for and they said that's for Harry and so that was Harry Chapin right so I got introduced to Harry Chapin and and Neil Young and James Taylor and Cat Stevens and Don McLean and they became the main aspect of my music and of course Gordon Lightfoot too and I'm like wow this guy there's something hauntingly beautiful about so much of his work and he captures this aspect and i want to talk about it a little later on if possible but yeah. he talks he captures an aspect about being canadian which many of us constantly fight to try to understand i think that there is something it's indescribable and particularly for an american it's hard to describe it you just know that it is the essence of canadiana i guess is i'm looking americana so you know yes. canadiana yeah, I, I sense that. And there's no word that there is for it. And again, as an outsider, certainly there wouldn't be, but it's encapsulating. And the fact that you mentioned him in the same breath as Stan Rogers, someone who left us way too soon, is a, a great tribute. So what do you like about his music? And there's any number of ways you can answer that. I understand that. But what to you keeps you coming back to listen? I think I first got pulled into Edmund Fitzgerald, of course, right? Sure. You know, and it constantly kept going on. And I was fascinated because of his connection to nature, which is part of the Canadian identity. Like people like to say, well, Canadians don't have an identity. Even Canadians say that all the time, right? But it's not true at all. It's just we struggle often by saying we're not Americans, right? No. <laughs> you know, no. I'm sure that. New Zealanders would say they're not Australianers, right? You know, yes. they're constantly yes. the same. But being the smaller group, what's fascinating for us is that our connection to nature is such an element that is we 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 create these small groups where we live outside of nature, but we are so a part of nature. 
and I'm talking about the Europeans that came to create Canada, we still see nature in this sense of awe, this sense of fear in some places, this sense of just something outside of ourselves that's beckoning for us to come back to. And so this song especially brings me back to my childhood. I grew up in Fergus, Ontario, which is probably outside of Fergus, Ontario. Bellwood is uh, 10 miles outside of Fergus, Ontario. So uh, Bellwood is closer. It's a smaller community, 300 people in the summertime, as I love to say. Wow. Very small. And so I lived his life. So when I take a look at this song, which was written for his childhood in Aurelia, well, my wife gave birth to my first son in Aurelia. We live north of that. So when I first started teaching, I worked in Perry Sound, which is north of Aurelia, past the Muskokas and stuff like that. And so Aurelia is so much in the same kind of vein of rural Ontario. And for an American to understand, I have to tell people that my favorite, favorite book is Charlotte's Web, because that was ah. my childhood. Uh-huh. So that there's that sense of, of wonder of being in that rural farm area. And so... I moved just now. I'm living in a house and we've talked about this. I'm living in a house with 30 acres. I grew up with five in Nova Scotia in the same kind of feeling place. Like places have a sense of feeling, right? So Mm -hmm. I drove through here with my wife and I went, this is where I want to live. This is this reminds me of Bellwood. This is Mm -hmm. where a small community, the whole bit. There's a lovely theater nearby that I'm all now suddenly now on the board, which is great. Um, oh, wow. There's local little artisans doing stuff everywhere that I've gotten a chance to be a part of. And everybody has this kind of same kind of connection. So pussy willows, cattails that I remember as a child doing all these things that he's talking about, like just being able to see all this, be out on my back porch, walking through the area, understanding this song kept haunting me. I knew Gordon Lightfoot before I ever knew anything about him, just by knowing his songs. You know, what you've said resonates with me on so many different levels. The connection to nature is something that means a lot to me, although I grew up in something that was a bit more urban. I mean, when I was growing up, the town that I lived in had 18,000 people. Now it's closer to 30,000. But I live three and a half miles from where my parents lived when they brought me home. So there's that aspect of being close to your roots. I proposed to my wife in the middle of a redwood grove, just because I knew that that was something that we would both enjoy seeing. And then you mentioned the haunting aspect of it. And this really is just a beautiful way of expressing the beauty of this song, because it's so unusual Even for Lightfoot, whose portrayals of the wilderness, both the American wilderness and the Canadian wilderness, are just so stark and so beautifully done, even given all of that, uh, this really does stand out. And that brings me to your experience with seeing Lightfoot perform. I never got a chance to see him, and it's always been a real thorn in my side. There was a time that I almost got to, but the amount of other Canadian performers I've seen, and then I just keep missing him. And there's a few of those people that that's the situation. Like the only time I got to see him was well, like his concerts that were videotaped, right? And it just broke my heart because I never got to see him. I saw Dan Hill. And Murray McLaughlin, I don't know if you know but those two guys. I know who um, Dan Hill is, yes. Yeah, Murray McLaughlin's another famous Canadian. And Valdi, all of those people that called the old projection room in Fergus with maybe 70 people. That's it. And they just came and performed by themselves on stage, right? Oh. Uh, I, and I did a lot of folk festivals, right? And I performed there as well, and I worked in many. I performed on the stage with Sarah McLaughlin back in early 80s. When she was just getting started kind of oh, thing, wow. we, we did a show where I was, all the performers got to play. That was in Guelph, Hillside Festival. I've seen Garnet Rogers live doing his historic trilogy. And there are a few things that you will never get back. I will never get back that opportunity. I remember friends of mine that I, I taught with and they saw me perform. I opened for um, James Keelahan. I don't know if you know him. I no. highly recommend you go and look for especially his first album my skies he was an award-winning and fantastic performer and i opened for him and my friends came to me and they said 
oh, you would have loved Toronto back in the day because they were older than I was. And they used to see him perform in Toronto in the 60s on a regular basis. And I was just so jealous that that scene, I was way too young for that. Yeah. I was born in the late 60s, right? So I just missed that stuff. But I didn't get to this stuff until the 80s when I was in my teens. And, yeah. and by then, he had become so popular. He was mostly in the States. He would come back every once in a while, but he would spend a lot of time in the States for a while. So I, I ended up missing that stuff. I would always catch whatever show I could find him on, find some interviews, see him perform again, because uh, it really inspired me. Because he he didn't play guitar. He didn't write songs like most other people wrote songs. Like Pussy Willow Cocktails, there's no real rhyme scheme in it, you know? But you don't even notice because it's so beautifully put together. And the words are, are all there, right? There are lines that are very specific in the whole bit that come through. But that's not what's important, right? It's how it moves along and how it sort of comes back to the beginning of each line. It's just fascinating. To me. Yeah, you mentioned the sort of lyrical structure of the whole thing. And yeah, it did just strike me. I mean, this is blank verse may not be the, the correct term, but there isn't a rhyme scheme in the way that you'd expect typical folk songs to do. This is more of a stream of consciousness more than anything else. So did you ever get a chance to meet the man? You, I know you never got a chance to see him live, but did you ever get a chance to shake his hand or meet him? No, I would have never washed the hand again. No, it was one of those. <laughs> and same thing with Harry Chapin, who was another big fan of his. I never got to see him. And yeah. I loved Harry's stuff as well. Strangely enough, though, when it comes to Harry, I got to meet his family because his brother owns a park out here in Nova Scotia. And oh. every year on the third week of August, they have the Chapin Family Festival where the whole living family, including his kids who perform, come out and sing all of his songs. So for years on and off, I would go and check those out. But yeah, I feel like I missed out because he was so close in Aurelia. <laughs> I was like, I think we would have been friends, man. We would have been friends. Yeah, you we... would have been tight. You were almost yeah. neighbors. Because I mean, now, and... Fergus, just to give us a sense of the geography, how far is Fergus from Aurelia? So, like I said, I live 10 miles from Fergus. It took me an hour to take the bus ride to school every day. Oh, wow. So it was kind of fun. So I lived in the country that way. But Fergus would probably be Instead of going by miles, I'd have to tell you by it'd probably be at a, an hour and a half drive. Okay. So I'm thinking maybe not quite the distance between San Jose and Sacramento. Right. Uh, right. You know, in, in terms yeah. of California. Okay. Because you have Toronto as the main center, right? Yeah. And if you go north of Toronto for about 45 minutes, maybe almost an hour, you will get to Aurelia. And if you go west, and slightly north, you'll get to Fergus for or Bellwood, same amount of time in about an hour or so, something like that. And I have this theory because I lived in Perry Sound, which is much further north, that where I grew up and where Aurelia is, that there is something super special about rural environments where there's farming communities because farming communities create culture. Because they're there for the land, so they'll create churches, they'll create museums, they'll create art galleries, they'll have theaters and stuff like that. You go a little further north, where I was in Perry Sound, that community moved three times in less than 60 years. The entire community would pick up and move for jobs. So there's like a frontier feeling where it's not quite the same. It was very busy in the summertime because it had all sorts of summer activities around the Great Lakes and stuff like that. But then as summer closed, everybody would shut their doors and the streets would roll up and you're like, OK, wait a minute. And you feel pretty left on your own. Mm -hmm. But I never felt that way in Fergus, Bellwood, Alora, Aurelia even because those people were always there creating those connections and community. And you could see that in even the, the interviews that Gordon Lightfoot talks about, like he went to the same church that I went to, not specifically, but the same church organization, the mm -hmm. most liberal church in Canada, which is called the United Church, different than the United Church in the United States. It's the most liberal church in Canada. It's famous for being the first church to have LGBTQ ministers kind of thing, right? right? And my mother is still involved with the UCW, which is the United Church Women's Group, 
which runs all of that. And he started off in a choir there in, in right. the really church. I was in the one in Bellwood. So we have all of these interesting connections. He's in a pod. Wow. Yeah. We'll be right back to our conversation with Jack Ward about pussy willows and cattails. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. Radio is so much different than it was in the 80s. We had it all. The music, the movies, the DJs, and morning shows. Back to the 80s Radio is a show from the 80s in podcast form. We bring the memories from that awesome decade back. Join Toscano and Chang every Friday as they take you on a ride back in time, sharing their experiences and laughs. Stop on by and discover some of the wacky things this crazy duo comes up with. They talk about it all. The good, the bad, and the ugly of the greatest decade. Don't miss the greatest 80s podcast in the world. Back to the 80s Radio. Is that song really a cover? What instrument are they playing there? What do those crazy lyrics mean? If you're the kind of person who thinks about stuff like that, you're in luck because I've got just the podcast for you. How Good It Is chooses a single song each episode and takes a dive into the story behind the song and the artist who made it famous. I'm Claude Call. You can find me in your favorite podcast software or just point your browser to howgooditis.com. How good it is. It's funny that you were so close in so many ways. It also means that you have an affinity for him and for the music also meeting him notwithstanding seeing him and in i concert, hate to tell you this too but it, there's a certain joy that i take in not breaking the image i have of not ever meeting him you know what i mean because i feel like if i saw him and he wouldn't recognize me because i feel like we're so connected i would be heartbroken because like who is this guy because really who am i compared to that but i've already built up after listening to this music and playing his music and stuff like that this friendship between this two this relationship that we have it would almost be spoiling it you know what i mean to to meet him in the same respect yeah and some people say never meet your heroes and you know you have that dynamic between the right. two of you even if it would mean more intimacy in some way it would also spoil the dynamic yeah. that you have set up sure. there cool you wanted to talk about pussy willow's cattails which is not a terribly well-known song. It wasn't released as a single. We'll talk about that a little bit later. I know that my own reasons for it is that it's sort of a Baroque pop song. And it's one of the first instances where he had orchestrated a song with something other than guitars and bass. The whole album is like that. The whole Did She Mention My Name, he was using orchestration. But why did you want to talk about that particular song today, given the fact that he has so many songs that resonate about nature and about that part of your lifetime? Why did this one stick out? Well, like I said, it screams my childhood, just those aspects of it. There's another aspect. My uh, Clark Kent job has been an English teacher for 20 years. And my superhero job is being a podcaster. One of the things I love from an English perspective is this particular song specifically speaks of the seasons. You could argue each verse is a different season in the oh, order yeah. of spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And uh, one of my great criticisms is back in my English times that I love, when I went through English literature and I did all these interesting criticisms and you'd have like Marxist criticisms and Foucault and you'd have various different criticisms. Certain ones have become really, really popular and they become sort of like everyday's shorthands. But nobody talks about Northrop Fry's seasons. Northrop Fry is a very famous Canadian essayist and critic. And so I began to really focus on how seasons are affecting not just my life, but cultures in the same way. In what season are we in right now in our society? And um, one can argue... We're rounding the bend in autumn, if not moving into winter, because things have changed so dramatically. Yes. My father, you know, born in 1940, said to me, you were born in a different country than your own children, just because of how things have changed. I was born in a different world. And he's 100% right. What he grew up with is yeah. closer to little rascals. Yes. Yeah. Than, than anything you would see today, right? So he him coming and watching my boy playing video games, it's an entirely different world. So here we have this bard who comes up with this song that 
identifies. And like you said, the Baroque aspect is fascinating because it adds to that timeless nature. This song could be sung now. It could have been done 300 years ago. It has no particular beginning, no particular ending. It's a song that you could pick up and play for somebody tomorrow and they would go, that's a beautiful song. And I've heard versions of this done by choirs in churches. Yes, so have I. And again, there are certain songs that just break through that veil of time and speak to so many aspects of human nature. And that's what I love about this song in particular for that reason. It really is a timeless song in a way that others are they're really only relevant in their context and this one because it's not mentioning anything really touched by humans or human history that makes it as timeless as it is what's the best setting for you to listen to this song if there is one is this one that you could listen to anywhere and have the same kind of feel or is there one time and place where you just feel this would really just hit home I think you're right. And two is it, not only is it timeless, I think it's placeless. I think this could show up in England in a medieval time, unless you're living in a desert or in an Arctic environment, right? There's this aspect of nature is all around us in that way. For me personally, it is in these places. It's in the Aurelia sphere of Bellwood, of where I'm living now, of finding a place in a rural area, not just near nature, but engaging with nature. I've picked up the guitar and just played it out of nowhere. I'll see a pussy willow and I'll just start singing it, right? It's just one of those things that engages that way. When it comes to listening, that's when I put it on. I have it on my phone, of course, and I'll put that along with other songs of that kind of type. Well, I'm really trying to reconnect with just the people that I care most about in the world. So driving around because I do a lot of driving in rural environments, remembering who I am, remembering the people I love, remembering the people that have left us and remembering the people that are never going to be gone. Well, this song is playing. Well, this time is revisiting. We have this amazing ability as human beings to continually bring people back from wherever they were, whether they've left us physically through death or just are no longer part of our lives anymore they still touch us. They still connect with us. Yeah. And the fact that you mentioned something in the rural area, I probably couldn't listen to this if I were in the middle of downtown San Francisco. No. Or some city might take me away, but it wouldn't really have the same impact. I would need to be in the countryside Mm -hmm. to listen to this. And I could listen to it at any time of the day or night and any time of year. But there are certain places I couldn't listen to it and have the same kind of feeling. I know that I got that feeling just from sitting in the suburb where I live, and that was beautiful, and right. even though I don't live in the country country, of course, but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm close enough to nature so that I can look at the mountains from my backyard and get that same kind of feel to it. So let's talk a little bit about the song, since we've talked a lot about the meanings of it. As you said, it was inspired by his upbringing in Aurelia, and in the complete greatest hit liner notes, he called the place, and I quote, a very idyllic spot. It was classic, a river, a pond, a dam, a stream down below, not much in the way of fish. And then he talks about how there was some industrial development near that. He'd watch the earth moving vehicles. That is so small town Ontario and that is such a thing where you've got this this counterpoint because the pussy willows could be in your ditch yeah and that close part of nature and then in the meantime you've got farm vehicles or earth moving vehicles or stuff doing their thing on the other side and you're just stuck by the dichotomy of it all yeah and although I'm glad that he didn't go into the dichotomy of man-made machinery conquering nature. Not that that's not a beautiful and important theme. We see that in countless other art forms, but I'm glad that he just kept it with the natural in this particular setting, because otherwise I think it would have spun into something kind of ugly. Yeah, for sure. Again, I think you brought up the point. Joni Mitchell is another perfect Canadian who does stuff like this, right? Yes. She, She does such a great job of, like my favorite song of hers was, I Wish I Were a River. 
so I could skate away on. Because again, all this stuff is such a straight Canadian feel, this idea, or her circle game, the seasonal things that move along, all that stuff happens in so much Canadiana. And it's, it's fascinating. I'm glad that you mentioned that because you have a perspective on it that I don't. Do you have any other angle on how the song got written? I think that's pretty much it. It's fascinating where I did some reading where people have said that they consider it to be perhaps the greatest Canadian folk song ever written, which is fascinating to me. And this is from other Canadians because we have so many to choose from, right? You know what I mean? But that obviously it touches people that strongly as a Canadian song. So that's cool. And it's interesting because it's not distinctly Canadian. There are places that have pussy willows and cattails and water and all these things everywhere in North America. Yeah. It doesn't brand it as being distinctly Canadian the way Alberta Bound or Canadian right. Railroad Trilogy. I mean, it says right up there in the exactly. or highway songs. I mean, the things yeah. where, you know, you know that it's Canadian because it says so. Right. But the fact that it's coming from somebody who was born and bred there and obviously yes. absorbed an appreciation for the wilderness yeah. uh, brands it that way. We'll be right back to our conversation with Jack Ward about pussy willows and cattails. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. Hey, do you like classic albums? Technically, like, you know, the 20th century albums. Um, such as, like, Beatles, Led Zeppelin, <laughs> Rolling Stones. I've only had Beatle episodes so far, however, I'll be doing more. But, welcome to my show, or rather, hey, welcome to, check out my show. <laughs> um, all those years ago, a classic album podcast with the dipping sauce. Um, as you can see, the Aaron George Harrison reference. Um, I review classic albums. Um... Not of those the likes of Beethoven, the likes of the Beatles and Rolling Stones, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, or what have you. <laughs> um, so yeah, check it out. It's every Monday. Um, and I do albums, conspiracies, songs, all that jazz. So just check it out. All those years ago, a classic album podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> Hello, I'm JT, a lifelong student of the paranormal and the unexplained. I've spent over 35 years researching and learning about a wide range of subjects, from UFOs and cryptids to ghosts and the supernatural, from hidden and lost treasures to mankind's mysterious past, and all other things mysterious and Fortean. Each week, I'll bring you some relevant and interesting articles in this genre, as well as a different topic, some you may be familiar with, but many you most likely will never have known existed. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride, and let me be your tour guide as we explore the unexplained on the paranormal sun. So let's start looking at the lyrics now. There are four verses, and I think it's pretty obvious that each of the verses is talking about a different season in the year. Rainbows in the woodland, water to my knees. And I love that line because he's wading through a creek or a stream. We don't know how old he is when this is happening. So his knees may be a foot off the ground or they may be two feet off the ground. But you don't get any more immersed in nature than that. You're wading through a creek and you're looking at 360 degrees around you. All of this is happening. It's like you're almost literally getting swallowed by the creation that's going on there. And so that's a perfect place for him to be seeing all this shivering, quivering, the warm breath of spring. So he's also witnessing this at the perfect time, which is when the earth is waking up. And I've felt this myself at the very end of winter, the very beginning of spring, there's just a little tension in the air and it's mm -hmm. cold still, but you can feel a little bit of humidity. You can feel a little bit of a change at least I do. And you know that the seasons are changing and you know that it's not going to be bitterly cold for very much longer. And you're going to see the flowers begin to bloom again. And you're going to begin to see the leaves growing again. And baseball season is starting and things like this. And then he goes to the second verse, which is about summer, catbirds and cornfields, daydreams together. Now let's stop that for a second. 
who or what is together with who or what? Daydreams together. Okay, well, cornfields can't dream. So is he doing right. personification here? What's that whole idea of daydreams together? Where is that coming from? He leaves that specifically vague. It kind of reminds me again of that James Keelan song, My Skies, where there's a whole aspect there. Are you talking about someone specifically? Because summer also ends up being the time of summer romance, right? And that's where people start to dream. Like how many times have you've had a summer romance and you've, oh, things will, you know, things will always be like this. And then, and then things fade, right? So it's, it's a seasonal aspect. And I, and I, and I caught that as well. Is that another thing too, that I, I think it's worth talking about when we talk about seasons, there aren't all, a lot of places in the world that has full four seasons. And I know That's lots true. of people will end up moving to Florida and that so they can escape a couple of seasons, <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. right? But I love four seasons. I love winter. I love spring. I love fall. I love summer. I couldn't imagine what life would be like in my life if I escaped and everything was always either sunny or rainy. I would miss out on so much. And I think that, like I said, the seasons become part of who we are summer is also that time of growing like we talk about you know the green of your life in springtime right that summer is such a sense of optimism and hope and deep unbridled innocent love and you I know you that mentioned the, the idea of the summer romance and it's kind of a storybook thing and i think every young person has had those even if it's not literally in the summer where you think this is going to last forever and you're so deeply in love or think you are so deeply in love that you can't imagine it's ever going to change. And then, of course, it does either literally with the changing of the season or just because the season of your life has moved on or both. Yes. And you can see that in the third line, reveling, disheveling, the summer nights can bring. It's the passion of summer, right? In that respect, you can look at it that way very much. Summer nights can bring so much joy and fun. It feels like you could continue all night long because it never gets cold, right? You know, just... Yeah. And not only that, but the sun isn't going down until later. So there's yeah. more daylight for you to enjoy that. And then the other thing that we skipped ahead on is riding on the roadside, the dust gets in your eyes. And I'm imagining he's riding a bicycle. It's dry. Riding a bike is going to kick up the dust that's there right. because there's no rain to hold it down. So it's another very faint allusion to childhood. You know, there's not a lot here that just screams childhood. It's just the human condition. Yeah. Slanted rays and colored days. You can see the naked limbs because the leaves have fallen off. Right. And wheat bins because this is the harvest season. And so the wheat that is grown, and I believe there's some massive agriculture in that part of Canada. I'm not, oh, I don't yeah. know, but I spent a lot of summers haying, as they call, where I would uh -huh. go out and collect hay. Combine would go create little square bales, and I would go out, toss them up on a wagon, put them in the barn for that. There was a lot of that going on. And still to this day, of course, all the apple picking, berry picking, <laughs> all mm -hmm. that stuff happens, right? So yeah, yeah, for sure. Voicing rejoicing, the wine cups do bring pussy wheels, those <laughs> cattails, soft winds and roses. And that's a very nice turn of phrase that he's just mm -hmm. coming back to that theme of those four plants, I guess. What might they be rejoicing over? A, a good harvest or... I would say that that's the main thing. Like, it's interesting, the wine cups, because those are often elements of communion as well, right? So those are elements where people talk about, and I'm not to bring that in, but it's part of the understanding of gratitude that he would have and people have in this area. It's like, not only do we bring this in, but we're also voicing and rejoicing. We can survive another winter. We can go through all of these things. Again, this it, it's not grounded in Aurelia. It's not grounded in Southern Ontario. These are him recognizing. I think in some ways, as he's writing this, he's stepping outside as much as he's stepping within his experience. He's stepping outside to see this has happened before. And not to quote Battlestar Galactica, these things have happened before and they will happen again, right? <laughs> we, are in the, we are in these cycles. And this is what you expect in the harvest in that respect. So. Yeah. And 
You mentioned gratitude. And although they don't happen on the same day, I mean, there's Canadian Thanksgiving and there's American yes. Thanksgiving, and I think they both happen in the month of November. Or no, am I wrong? No, Canadian is usually the second weekend of October. I stand or corrected. Earlier. But the whole idea of both those holidays being times for celebration and for gratitude Maybe coinciding with the harvest, maybe not, right. but certainly a time for gratitude. That was the other 100%. thing that I thought of. Yeah. And then harsh nights and candle lights, wood fires ablaze and soft lips and fingertips resting in my soul. And I couldn't help but think, okay, this might've been a leftover verse from a song from a winter's night, which he had already written and had already released by this time, but it's the same kind of once his lover has gotten there they're going to be experiencing that intimacy. Treasuring, remembering the promise of spring, and that brings it full circle again. Right. And that's another thing that's just marvelous about the song is that he finds himself back where he started. Right. And it's the implication that the cycles of nature, the seasons of time are going to keep going. Yeah. I love the term, even the first line of harsh nights and candlelights. That's something every Canadian can understand. You have these changes of weather where the cold can get so bitter instantaneously, right? And so right now, I've got a wood fire blazing over here because it's, it's a whole part of who we are. The joke is a Canadian is someone who can make love in a canoe and a cabin. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I hadn't the, heard I, that one. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, okay. I think it started off with a canoe with Pierre Burton, a famous writer. Because they were sort of saying, what is a Canadian? That was one of his definitions. Mm -hmm. But the idea that we spend so much time kept in our own domiciles, that's what's created so many great Canadian artists, right? You'll find, you could go down the list of comedians. It's unbelievable. And actors and people that most people don't even recognize are Canadian. And that's because we spend so much time connecting with each other in a small quarters you had to spend so many years sort of focusing on yourself. I grew up in the country. That's where I grew my love of writing, my my love of storytelling yeah. in these winter things when there's not much else to do, but to sit down and connect and understand humanity and all those kinds of things. You can't get lost in all the other stuff that you can in the summertime. <laughs> you know, well, so. and you think of Ian Tyson talking about the four strong winds. Right. By then it would be winter, not too much for you to do. That's right. Because you're literally stuck. And yeah. me being a California kid whose idea of a bitterly cold day is when it's 52 degrees, I'm such a tenderfoot when it comes to that kind of winter. I have experienced a New York City winter, and that was as bad as I wanted to get. Thank you very much. I can only imagine the kind of bonding, the kind of intimacy, forced or otherwise, that you have during a Canadian winter. And it's maybe it's something I need to experience once in my life. I don't know. I guess it's minus 58 Fahrenheit. I'm trying to look at this up. Minus 58 Fahrenheit is something you would be regularly finding out in places like uh, Manitoba in yeah. the wintertime. And so the group Guess Who, mm -hmm. as you probably know who they are, and Bachman Turner Overdrive, they said the only way they became such a great band is in the middle of the winter, there was nothing for them to do but practice and perform. Neil Young, right. too. I mean, he grew up Neil in Young. and around Winnipeg. That's right. There was a big Winnipeg breakout and for the same reason. There's a lot of music that came out of that particular area at that time because of those things. So, yeah, winter is huge. Jim Carrey from Ontario originally. Mm -hmm. William Shatner, Montreal. I could go on and on and on the list. But I remember at one time in the 90s, every single female artist at the top of their game was Canadian. Yeah. Alanis Morissette, Sarah McLaughlin, and then you had Shania Twain, yeah. all uh, the number one other charts. And you're like, how is this possible? They're all at the top <laughs> of all this stuff. And it's, it's this Canadian character of being isolated with nature and a lot of stuff to do. Joni Mitchell being so sick for so long, stuck in her room, learning how to draw, learning how to write music. All of that was a part of her Canadian heritage too and growth. We had a I lot do. of podcasters in the early days. Oh, More I'll podcasters, bet. Canadian podcasters did well than, than anywhere else in the world at one point, just for that same reason. And well, they should have, and still then <laughs> they still do. 
that's all I had for part one of this interview. You'll be listening to part two in just a couple of weeks. And until then, run for the roses, but don't forget to stop and smell them. Mm-hmm.